morning, everyone. We're a couple minutes late, um, and I suspect more folks will be joining uh, throughout the course of the uh, hour, and hour and a half. So I'm going to get started with the opening. Welcome to the Trade Webinar Series. My name is Dr. Jani Remy. I am the Deputy Director of the Sridhar Rampal Center for International Trade Law Services and Policy. And I am joined by my co-facilitator in this webinar series, Mrs. Colofello Kruger, who will introduce herself subsequently. We hail respectively from the Caribbean and Africa and have common backgrounds in trade, having met during my time and her time, she's still in Geneva, where I used to work and where she currently works. As friends, first and foremost, we conceptualize this webinar series because we realize that although we were really far advanced in our understanding of the WTO, we knew very little about each other's regional integration frameworks. After weeks of planning and discussing, we are proud to present to you this in the first in a, of a series of special trade webinars ranging from discussions on trade to investments to dispute settlement to new areas like e-commerce and MSMEs with featured speakers from the Caribbean and Africa. While our leaders in the, these continents and regions have said a lot about the importance of the trade relationship between the Caribbean and Africa, we realized that we didn't know much about each other's individual regional integration components. I would invite you to have a look at the SRC's quick guide, which I will bring up on our screen, created by one of the SRC's trade researchers, Ms. Chelsea Brathwaite, that looks very quickly at Africa CARICOM trade relations. And although they have been characterized by a unique sense of shared culture and identity with origins slave, tracing way back to the triangular slave trade, there are very few actual direct trade relations between the Caribbean and Africa, something that our leaders hope to change. So you will see, and we will share the link, that we have been in alignment with African countries for a long time, ranging from initiatives like the G77, the ACP. We are part, all part, many of the African countries and the Caribbean countries are part of the Commonwealth. And we share some negotiating space and positions at the WTO. Um, but there is still quite limited trade between our respective regions, accounting with for only about 3.2% of CARICOM's total trade and with trade still confined to sort of commodity, non-manufactured, but commodity areas. So there is quite a lot of room for further growth and discussion of how we move from these more cultural relationships to actual direct trading relationships. And you can see from this slide that who are the main trade export markets um, with which CARICOM countries trade. So we will make these slides uh, available as I mentioned, but the idea of this webinar series is to begin speaking to each other. And I'm pleased to do so together with Colo Fellow with other regional entities across the Caribbean and Africa. And I'd like to mention our co-hosts, Tralac, Trapka, Afronomics Law, the PJ Patterson Center for Africa Caribbean Advocacies. And also to mention that we have featured speakers from the IC ITC, the AFCFTA, and the CARICOM Secretariat. So the aim of this webinar series being mainly to highlight crucial components of the integration process. Each webinar, save for this one, which is a special one because we have with us the Secretary General of the AFCFTA, will last for about one hour, with this one lasting for about one hour and 30 minutes. Um, 
the Secretary General will speak about the new kid on the regional integration block, the AFCFTA, which is gathering a lot of excitement, for which we and the Caribbean hope to be able to share some of our success and not so successful stories with the AFCFTA as they progress on their journey. So without any more from me by way of introduction, let me also pass the floor on to my co-facilitator, uh, Kola Fellow, to say a few welcome remarks. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. As uh, Janina say, uh, Geneva said, my name is Kola Fellow Kugler. And in addition to working for the Advisory Center on WTO Law in Geneva, I'm also the co-founder of Trade Policy Exchange. And that is the hat that I'm wearing today. Um, I'm not going to belabor all the points that Geneva has made, but this relationship goes far beyond you know, just friendships. And we hope that we really start to garner you know, a movement that pushes our symbolic relationships to you know, actual trade flows and exchange of services and investment and goods. And of course, and ideas and knowledge and experiences. And it's really with much excitement and anticipation that we open this webinar you know, to just extend our friendship beyond the corridors and to really come in to learn about you know, our different systems and very similar but also unique systems. And of course, our friendship is underpinned on you know, historical and probably very painful past, but that moves beyond that. And I think it's time for our regions to really start you know, putting our money where our mouths are. And so without any further ado, I would like to turn the floor back to Janine who will introduce Ambassador Richard Bonnell, and then thereafter I will introduce uh, Ambassador uh, Mene. Thank you very much. Excellent, Kolo. Thank you for these stirring words. Let me ask the research fellow at the PJ Patterson Center for African Caribbean Advocacy, named after a beloved Caribbean integrationist and former prime minister of Jamaica. The center is based at the UE Mona campus. Um, but I will ask the research fellow, uh, Ambassador Richard Bernal, who is a pro vice chancellor for global affairs, or has been a, a pro vice chancellor for global, global affairs at the University of the West Indies, chief trade negotiator for CARICOM and director general at the then Caribbean Regional Negotiating Machinery, member of the board of directors of the IDB up to 2016. His CV is way too lengthy uh, for me to recite everything right now. So Ambassador Bernal, in order for you to give some introductory remarks, the floor is yours. Good morning. Madam Chairperson, Madam Co-Facilitator, Ambassador, Secretary General, distinguished panelists, participants in this webinar series. Good morning and welcome. I'm very pleased to be making a brief remark on behalf of the PJ Patterson Center for African Caribbean Advocacy based at the University of the West Indies Mona campus. I want to congratulate all of those who conceived of this seminar series on African Caribbean trade for three reasons. One, we have talked about it for a very long time, going back to the days of Marcus Garvey and the Pan-African advocates, we have spoken about the, the possibilities of this trade. Secondly, the enormous untapped potential of the trade. And thirdly, the fact that it is a propitious time. It's very timely for us to further our discussion on this issue because of the recently formed Trans-African Free Trade Agreement and the Caribbean continues to deepen its integration process, which is one of the longest running integration processes to date. I look forward to the presentation and look forward to the results which come out of this series of seminars, hopefully to advance the trade and to expand the mutual peace and prosperity between Africa and the Caribbean. Thank you, Madam Chair. Excellent opening re remarks. Thank you so much, Ambassador Bernal. I'm so pleased that uh, at the University of the West Indies, there's a dedicated 
advocacy center uh, for promoting these relations and I hope that all who are on the call will take advantage of, of that center um, and work uh, collaboratively to advance advocacy of joint positions of our regions. Over to you, Kolo, to make the introductions for our keynote speaker. Thank you very much, Janif. It's really an honor and a privilege for me to be uh, introducing uh, His Excellency Mr. Juan Kelemene, who is also a compatriot of mine. So, doubly happy and proud and to be introducing him. So, I'll just uh, you know, set out his, his bio and then I'll just leave the floor to him without any further ado. So uh, His Excellency Mr. Mene was elected by the 33rd Ordinary Session Assembly of the Heads of States and Government of the African Union to the position of the Secretary General of the AFCFTA. Before his uh, election to his current position, he was the Chief Director of Africa Economic Relations at the Department of Trade and Industry of South Africa where he was the chief trade negotiator of the AFCFTA and the tripartite FTA negotiations. Prior to that, he was the director of international trade and investment law at the same Department of Trade and Industry in South Africa. Between 2010 and 2015, he represented South Africa at the World Trade Organization as a delegate. And during his uh, tenure at the WTO as a delegate, he was elected to be the chairman of the Committee on International Trade in financial services, which comprises of trade negotiators, financial regulators, and financial policymakers from over 160 countries. Prior to that, he worked in uh, private law firms in London and also in Hong Kong. Uh, His Excellency Mr. Mena has written and lectured internationally on international trade law. He holds a Bachelor of Arts Law, and he also holds a Master's of Arts from uh, the School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London and also an LLM in Banking and Law and Financial Regulation from the LSE. So without any further ado, I would like to turn the floor to our keynote speaker, His Excellency, Mr. Wankele Mene. Thank you very much, Kulu, um, and thank you to Dr. Remy and the Ambassador for uh, putting together this uh, event. I think that um, I could not agree uh, more with uh, what uh, uh, the ambassador said and what uh, uh, Dr. Remy said, the relationship between um, the Caribbean and um, many countries in Africa uh, is a uh, political, uh, historical uh, relationship, a brotherhood, a sisterhood uh, that runs very, very deep. But what we have not been able to achieve Um, And if we can be self-critical, what we have not been able to achieve over the last uh, uh, 50 to 60 years is um, investment and trade uh, links between the two parts uh, of the world. And so we have a political philosophy that uh, we share. We have a shared vision of pan-Africanism, as Ambassador said, um, uh, uh, Marcus Garvey contributed significantly to uh, uh, Pan-Africanism, but we have not been able to see all of that translating into meaningful commercial trade and investment relations across the two uh, regions. And it's also unfortunate, if I may uh, say that um, the context which brings us together in terms of a legal instrument is um, historically has been the um, in the ACP and the economic partnership uh, agreements um, and the negotiations that happen in the context of the ACP. That too um, is an unfortunate uh, observation to make because we have to think about independently, how do we make sure that uh, as the two regions independent of the EU independent of any other uh, third uh, party, how do we start building a meaningful trade and investment uh, relationship? And that is a critical question and it's a very timely question because today we now have an African continental free trade area, uh, which has been uh, ratified by 38 countries, bringing together and consolidating a market of uh, 1.3 billion people 
with a combined GDP of 3.4 uh, trillion United States dollars, which is projected in um, by the year 2035, uh, it is projected that it will be a market close to 8 trillion United States dollars. So it's a very, very significant market. Uh, and as you know, in before the, um, the pandemic in 2019, of the 10 fastest growing economies in the world, six were in Africa at that time. Many countries in Africa were growing at an average of about 3.5, 3.4%. So the investment outlook certainly was very, very positive. And now that we have uh, the African continental free trade area, we have a very, very unique opportunity to build on the AFCFTA and to build a, a properly structured trade relationship between the Caribbean and uh, countries on the continent. Of course, we are not yet a customs union. The African Union does have a, a vision and, a, and an ambition uh, in accordance with the Abuja Treaty. We do have an ambition that very soon we will become a customs union. Uh, and we will follow the steps of, um, of integration right up until Africa um, is, is, a, is a monetary union. But for now, the next step that we're going to take is to be a customs union. Of course, nobody knows how long that will take, but certainly it gives us the, an opportunity. Once we do become a customs union, it gives us an opportunity for the Caribbean and for African countries to legally structure a trade relationship uh, to make sure uh, that the, the benefits, the benefits of this massive market that we have on the African continent that uh, countries in the Caribbean are able to export to this very, very important market. We uh, are coming from a very low base. If you um, in general characterize Africa's economy, um, we are characterized by uh, smallness of national economies, lack of competitiveness, uh, shallow uh, productive capacity, manufacturing capacity that is shallow. Um, we continue to export primary commodities uh, to countries of the North. This is something that is uh, a real source of pain for me because 60, 70 years down the line, we continue to be trapped in this uh, colonial economic model of continuing to export primary commodities, uh, mainly to countries of the North. This has been the, 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 the general attribute of Africa's economy until now, which is in part why intra-Africa trade is at such a low uh, percent of uh, between 15 and 18 percent. So we trade more, for example, with the European Union than we trade amongst um, ourselves as, uh, as, as the African, uh, as African countries. And so the objective of the African continental free trade area is to, is to change that, uh, to dismantle completely this uh, colonial economic model that we've sustained over the years. It is also intended that uh, through the establishment of regional value chains, that we will be able to enhance Africa's uh, industrial capacity, that we will now start focusing on, on building a market, market of 1.2 billion people. And I think this is a very, very important aspect for those in the Caribbean to uh, pay attention to this fast growing market that we have on the continent. So the African continental free trade area is probably the single uh, most important tool for Africa's economic development since the end of colonialism. Apologies about the phone in the background. So it is the single most important tool for Africa to advance our economic uh, objective since the end of colonialism. We have looked at trade agreements from around the world. We've looked at the WTO. We've looked at what has worked and we looked at what has not worked. And I'm very happy to say that um, one of the lessons that we learned 
and that we, we made sure that we have a very, very strong development dimension in this trade agreement. This trade agreement focuses on industrial development. It is going to have um, a protocol on women in trade and young people. And all of these things are very, very important. They are not hardcore trade issues as we, as we all know, but they are very important development dimensions. And all of the um, failures and successes that we had at the WTO over the years, there are many, many times when we raised issues of development interest, and we were told that, no, 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 the WTO is not um, into uh, uh, development. The WTO is only about trade regulation and liberalization of markets. If you want development, go and get it somewhere else. So what we've done is to craft an agreement that actually that captures Africa's development uh, imperatives and objectives. And that is why I am very, very proud of what we have achieved um, in terms of the, 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 the legal focus that we have given to industrial development, to women uh, in trade, to young people in trade, all of these very important aspects uh, that we uh, uh, were not able to advance at the WTO. Now, what is the scope of the agreement? The ambition is very, very high. Um, we want in 15 years time, 97% of products traded in Africa will be traded at zero duty in less than 15 years. Very, very ambitious objective. We know it's going to be difficult. We know that it is uh, not everybody will be able to um, immediately start the tariff reduction, but um, we have given ourselves enough time, a transition period uh, of just less than uh, 15 years to make sure that 97% of products traded in Africa are at zero duty. We do know that, um, that the, it is not enough to simply eliminate or reduce tariffs. That is why we're also paying particular attention to uh, non-tariff barriers. We launched uh, some time ago uh, an online portal for the resolution of, um, of non-tariff barriers, which is something that has to be, as we all know, attendant to, to tariff reduction. The agreement covers trade in goods, trade in services. There will be a protocol on investment protection and facilitation competition policy, intellectual property rights, digital trade, um, women and young people in, in trade. These are the pillars of um, the, the, the agreement as, a, as it has been established and is now being implemented by 38 countries. Trade in services is an important part of Africa's economy particularly uh, countries that, uh, that are landlocked um, and countries who rely uh, on a range of different technologies, uh, such as digital platforms. It's important that we, we develop a framework, a regulator framework for how um, digital trade and e-commerce will, will, um, will, uh, will be done uh, through the AFCFTA. And so the, the scope is wide, the ambition is high. Uh, yes, we know there will be challenges. Uh, there will be challenges with infant industry. There will be challenges with uh, rules of origin. Uh, there will be challenges with transshipment of goods. Uh, these will be significant challenges. It is not easy to consolidate a market of um, uh, 38 countries now countries that are at different levels of economic development, countries uh, that on the one hand you have um, Somalia with a GDP capita of uh, 110 US dollars. On the other extreme, you have uh, Equatorial uh, Guinea with a GDP per capita of $25,000. And so these um, stark economic differences will cause uh, challenges uh, from time to time. And so our immediate task, our immediate task is to build the capacity of individual countries, 
particularly from uh, the standpoint of customs procedures. We, we know that uh, there are very severe consequences. There will be very severe consequences if there is trans transshipment of goods, if countries are able to import a shirt, put a button on it and say made in the FCFTA, that is going to cause job losses. And certainly we do not want this agreement to create job losses. We want this agreement to create jobs. And so we will prioritize uh, customs procedures and the building of the capacity of our uh, customs officers so that they implement the rules of origin uh, of the agreement as agreed. The rules of origin are not just for the purpose, as you know, of pre preventing transshipment. The types of the type of rules of origin regime that we have crafted is very, very deliberate. It is intended to accelerate Africa's industrialization. The threshold for, for value addition is very high because as I said a few minutes ago, we do not want a country to import a, a shirt, put a button on it and say made in the FCFTA. So the agreement, the rules of origin that we are negotiating now, if you look at them, the threshold is quite high uh, for the purpose of advancing Africa's industrial development objectives. So for the moment, we are, we are almost 86% concluded with our rules of origin. We have a, a few more weeks of work to do, but I'm confident that uh, we will be in a position to report to the heads of states when they meet that we have concluded 90% rules of origin and rules of origin that actually will make a difference on Africa's industrial development capacity. Let me conclude by observing that the, there will not be, in my view, there will not be another opportunity for Africa to accelerate industrial development um, if we miss this opportunity. That is why this agreement is so very, very important and its implementation uh, is very, very important. It's aggressive implementation is very, very important because I cannot think of another time in the history of the African continent where we had an opportunity through this, through an agreement, a trade agreement, we had an opportunity to establish regional value chains across the continent to target particular areas of growth, pharmaceuticals, automobiles, agro-processing, all of these industrial development initiatives that we are engaging on, the, 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 the basis for that is the agreement establishing the African continental free trade area. And so we have to work hard. We have to make sure that we meet the positive projections. The World Bank last year projected that where this agreement is implemented effectively, Africa has a unique opportunity to lift 100 million Africans out of more moderate po poverty and extreme poverty by the year 2035. And that also, where we implement this agreement effectively, we have an opportunity to contribute to Africa's GDP up to $450 billion by the year 2035. So all of this is very, very encouraging. All of these positive projections are very encouraging, but they are not going to happen on their own. We as Africans will have to work hard, implement this agreement, confront the challenges that we know will be there so that in 20, in 15 years time, we, we, do, we do succeed in, in taking 100 million Africans out of uh, poverty. So this conversation that you have initiated, this webinar series is very, very important as we look to one another's experiences of economic development, industrial development, um, and, and, and growth. And I hope that we will be able to come up with concrete actions, concrete actions about what it is that the Caribbean and Africa can do to um, boost intra-regional trade between our, our regions. So once again, thank you very much for the opportunity. And I look forward to uh, continued continued conversations. Thank you.
Thank you very much indeed, Secretary General. I mean, you know, and thank you for these words of welcome, I mean, of opening this uh, webinar series. What comes out from the SG's um, in opening address was the ambition is high and the scope is wide, but the time is now. And that's really, you know, both daunting and challenging. And I think another thing that he mentioned that the Caribbean and Africa have in common are small national economies, lack of competitiveness, and shallow manufacturing capacities. And these are the type of experiences that we hope to share in this webinar series, how both regions can learn from each other and how we can sort of, you know, use each other's experiences to increase inter-regional trade and also to reach development objectives in both regions. And so without further delays, I would like to introduce our first speaker who will very, you know, aptly follow on the SG's opening address. And his name is Mr. Prudence uh, Sebahizi, and I will just pull up his uh, bio quickly. He is the Chief Technical Advisor on the African Continental Free Trade Area and provides technical and strategic advice to the Secretary General and the AFCFTA institutions. Prior to this, he was the head of the AFCFTA Negotiation Support Unit at the African Union Commission since August 2016. And he's been involved basically with the negotiation of the AFCFTA since the very, very beginning. Prior to his tenure at the African Union Commission, he worked with the government of Rwanda for more than 10 years and has spent some time with civil society organization. Mr. Sebahizi holds a master's degree in international development policy from Seoul National University in South Korea. And before I open the floor to him, he will be addressing the scope and obviously governance structures in African regional integration. I think we all should remember that the AFCFTA is not the beginning of Africa's regional integration, but rather the end and you know, heading towards the end goal. And so as we listen to Mr. Sibahizi, I hope we understand that although this is a very important initiative and a very important agreement, but it already is built upon foundations of years and years of different initiatives from the different regional economic communities. So without further delay, I would like uh, Mr. Sibahizi to take the floor. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Color fellow for the for the introduction. Um, uh, let me start by uh, confessing that when my boss has spoken, and uh, him being more experienced than I uh, on international trade matters, uh, I, I felt uh, a bit shy to uh, to add anything to what he said, um, and he's comprehensively addressed the FCFTA from. Um, the historical perspective, from the score perspective, from the impact perspective, and from the opportunities uh, perspective. Um, I will just uh, add my voice uh, to his, um, uh, emphasizing uh, most of the point that he's touched on, and also uh, making sure that I do not um, repeat uh, entirely what he said. So, in other words, um, my presentation has been made much, much easier. Um, let me start by emphasizing that uh, the FCFTA um, is a journey. It's a journey that started long ago, um, uh, as uh, the previous speakers have said, in the historical background of uh, Africa's integration agenda. Um, we can trace uh, integration back from uh, 1900 years. Um, and when you look at the history of Africa, even before um, um, uh, the African countries uh, regained their independence in 1963, when the Organization of African Unity was founded, there have been a number of um, gathering for Pan-Africanists trying to make sure that they achieve uh, what we can call um, Africa's political uh, liberation. And now the FCFTA positioned itself in the next Africa's agenda to look for economic freedom. And this is very important to look at FCFTA from an um, economic point of view. Um, of course, um, the legal foundation for the FCFTA, uh, which is known as the Abuja Treaty, 
uh, the treaty establishing the African Economic Community uh, looks at uh, consolidating Africa's market as one uh, market uh, in the year 2028. 20, uh, and the FCFTA um, is in the middle of the journey. Uh, there is a lot that has been achieved so far, but there is also a lot to be, uh, to be achieved in the future. Um, let me um, remind the audience that uh, uh, in Africa, uh, we have uh, eight recognized regional economic communities. And those eight recognized regional economic communities have played their part in integrating Africa at regional level. And they are the, uh, the, the foundation, they are the building blocks of um, Africa's um, economic integration. Uh, you've seen the East African community, uh, which is now um, a monetary union almost a monetary union, East African community started as a customs union in the year 2000. It moved to a common market in the year 2010, and now uh, they are building a monetary union. So it is a customs entity. Uh, we have uh, COMESA, the common market for Eastern and Southern Africa, uh, which is also a customs union today uh, in the making. It has uh, created the largest free trade area on the continent. We have uh, ECOWAS, um, the economic community for West African uh, um, countries. Uh, we have SADEC, um, we have uh, IGAD, we have uh, um, uh, Union Maghreb, um, Arab Maghreb, we have uh, the Censad. So all those are the economic communities on the continent that have made their efforts to integrate the regions but at the same time, uh, contributing to the building of African economic community. So the FCFTA is, um, is, is taking experience from those regional economic communities and it is consolidating the market of Africa into uh, one market, uh, which is going to be attractive, attractive for investors from outside the continent, but also attractive for investors from within the continent. Um, the other important aspect, uh, which His Excellency, uh, the Secretary General has touched on, is how FCFT is going to, uh, to strengthen the productive capacities of the continent. Africa has, has been known for uh, exporting uh, raw materials and importing everything that we consume for a long time. And this pattern of trade is not sustainable. It's not sustainable in the sense that we are spending a lot on imp imports and gaining almost nothing when it comes to what we are trading with the rest of the world. Africa's trade with the rest of the world accounts for about 82%, which means that intra-African trade is only 18%. So we are trading amongst African countries at a level of only 18%. And the trade with the rest of the world is 82%, which is not sustainable because it's a trade of raw materials against uh, the finished product that we consume. So the FCFTA looks at changing that, um, uh, that status of trade, which is not sustainable by building our own productive capacities, by trying to um, uh, promote manufactured products that will uh, add value to our production in the process creating jobs, opportunities, and then um, have um, an equal trading terms with the rest of the world. Uh, that's a very important point to, uh, to emphasize. And in terms of scope, um, the FCFT has looked at a number of issues, uh, not only trading goods and trading services, but also areas of strengthening our policy framework, um, issues related to intellectual property rights, uh, competition policy, uh, investment uh, policy, e-commerce, and digital trade, uh, women in trade, um, young uh, entrepreneurs and youth in trade, all those issues are going to be addressed by the FCFTA legal instrument to make sure uh, that we strengthen our policy framework, but also our institutional uh, framework. Um, there is one thing that I want to emphasize. Um, is how do we plan to implement um, the African continental free trade area? 
um, I think this is um, very important because if we have to succeed uh, with this ambitious uh, agenda for the continent, we have to put a lot of efforts in the way we implement um, this FCFTA. Um, one of the tools that have been developed is um, the FCFTA uh, implementation strategies. All countries in Africa are expected to, uh, to develop their FCFTA implementation strategies. And those strategies are supposed to address uh, policy related issues, are supposed to address institutional issues, are supposed to address issues related to uh, stakeholders engagement, are supposed to make sure that they strengthen their national uh, capacities to position uh, their production structures um, in the global um, competitive uh, market. And uh, by so doing, we have to make sure that we, we maximize uh, the inclusive uh, trade opportunities. Uh, that's the reason why we've been talking about women, we've been talking about youth, um, people with disabilities will, be, will not be um, left behind. The participation of all a spectrum of um, uh, social groups uh, will have to be um, involved in the implementation of the FCFTA agreement to make sure uh, that the agreement is successful. Um, the other aspect that I want to emphasize on the implementation side of the FCFTA is that um, countries have to look at how to maximize the benefits of integration, but also uh, protecting their national economies because their national economies have to grow and by growing they will compete um, uh, with the rest of the world, they will compete with the rest of the, um, the, the, the continental markets. Um, the level of ambition of the FCFTA, which is now uh, looking to liberalize up to 97% um, of, of total trade, has left uh, a window to uh, national policies, a window of 3%, uh, which is uh, designated as, um, uh, as, as, as excluded product that will be excluded from uh, tariff liberalization. And that's where um, the issue of protecting infant industries is going to come in. Um, it has been agreed that um, that exclusion list, each country is going to have the prerogative of the of, of deciding on which product to exclude from, uh, from liberalization. And the criteria which have agreed on uh, will be uh, based on food security, um, national security, fiscal revenue, um, livelihood and industrialization. So those are the criteria that are going to be uh, justifying um, the exclusion of 3% uh, out of uh, tariff liberalization. And if we, we are able to implement fully uh, the FCFTA in the next 10 to 13 years, uh, we should be able to have 97% um, of um, total trade in Africa uh, liberalized, meaning that imports uh, will be coming in um, as long as they fulfill the rules of origin, uh, they will be coming in um, uh, free, uh, duty free and quota, quota free. Um, I also want to emphasize on the institutional side of the FCFTA implementation. Uh, we have the Regional Economic Community Secretariats, which have been um, implementing a number of trade-related policies with their own experiences in, in building the capacities of their member states with a lot of experience in mobilizing the stakeholders around trade and with their own experiences in also uh, dealing with the policy reviews. So we, we are ready to work with those secretariats at regional level to make sure that uh, the commitments of uh, AFCFT state parties are very well implemented at national level. Um, there will be, of course, uh, national implementation committees um, which are being established uh, in all AFCFT state parties. And this can be seen as platforms where all the stakeholders who want to play a role in the implementation of the FCFT are going to, uh, to meet uh, uh, regularly with the national policymakers uh, to make sure that their interest in the FCFT process 
um, are safeguarded. Um, in terms of um, trade goods, the FCFTA uh, protocol on trade goods is very wide. It's very wide. Uh, it addresses issues of rules of origin. It addresses issues of customs, uh, customs cooperation. It addresses issues of trade facilitation, issues of um, non-tariff barriers, issues of um, sanitary and phytosanitary measures, issues of standards and technical barriers to trade, and issues of trade remedies. So it's very comprehensive in a way uh, that um, trade in goods uh, within the FCFTA uh, should actually be um, the, the, the most, um, uh, uh, I mean, the best addressed in, in terms of a legal framework on the continent when you compare the FCFTA um, legal instrument with existing uh, trade uh, regime on the continent, you will say that FCFT is the most ambitious um, trade agreement that we have on the continent so far. Uh, that's why we look at it as the umbrella of other existing trade regimes on the continent. And if fully implemented, it will be able to uh, bring Africa to one continental market. So without um, uh, further ado, I would like to um, uh, hand over back to the moderator. I'll be happy to respond to specific questions uh, that will come up. I just want to give that um, general overview of the FCFTA and where we are heading. And I would like to emphasize that FCFTA is going to be um, the biggest success story for the continent. It's going to be the biggest um, hope for Africans if we have to achieve our economic freedom. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Sebahizi. That was an excellent overview. Um, at certain junctures in your presentation, I sort of felt I could swap Africa for the Caribbean. You mentioned um, many issues that plague us including the small volume of intra-regional trade. I think you mentioned in the case of intra-African trade, it was something like 18% uh, across CARICOM. Intra-regional trade stands at something between 13 and 16%. Um, you mentioned the fact that the AFCFTA is building on other pre-existing sort of regional arrangements. We in the Caribbean have, among the CARICOM countries, certain subgroupings, including most notably the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, the OECS, which comprises some of the smaller members of CARICOM and are specially accommodated within the regime of CARICOM in some ways, but some may say uh, not as expansively as you, have do you are doing at the AFCFTA. You mentioned implementation as a huge behemoth to overcome. Anyone who has studied the Caribbean integration process will know by now the problem of the implementation deficit, which is like um, the AFCFTA, our model of integration follows, not a supranational approach, but really an intergovernmental approach, which really relies heavily on member states to implement the obligations without having an entity that sort of can do it for them. Um, and I noticed that you have quite a ambitious set of uh, implementation tools in order to overcome uh, what you perhaps perceive as ensuring inclusiveness. So you have a stakeholder engagement process, you have inclusiveness, bringing women, the disabled, the youth. Um, you also mentioned your level of ambition, which is uh, eye-wateringly um, sort of, well, to use the word again, um, hopeful and ambitious in the sense of freeing up 97% of trade, um, at least in goods, in services, in CARICOM also, we have a services regime like you have. We have good services uh, at some of our uh, areas of for further work. Our work program um, would look at yours as being you know, quite, um, you know, ambitious, again, that's the word, 
uh, and we have quite a lot of experience, I would say, in trying to put these work programs in place. So I just wanted to sort of draw on some of the similarities, but also some of the differences, and uh, to commend the, uh, the African countries for this level um, of hopefulness of trying to, to move their continent in the right direction of indigenizing trade. Uh, to help me to present the CARICOM perspective, let me uh, introduce a friend, uh, but also a professional, um, Mr. Junior Lodge. Uh, he is an independent trade and development consultant who recently served as technical advisor to the Caribbean in the context of post Cotonou negotiations. Uh, his previous engagements have included heading both the EU-funded TBT and MTS programs, coordinating technical CARA forum positions and negotiations under the CARA forum EPA and DDA, Doha Development Agenda Negotiations, uh, where he sat as a CARICOM in the CARICOM Office of Trade Negotiations, previously the CRNM. He has also served as executive director at the London-based JAMCO, representing commercial and lobbying interests of the Jamaican banana industry, um, and began his public service career as director of trade policy at JAMPRO. His recent publications include a contribution on EU soft power in trade and development for the EUI ECBPM Respect Project, case studies for ECBPM political economy analysis, and a paper, ACP Successes and Failures. He's co-editor of the book, Care Forum EU EPA, A Practitioner's Analysis. And the reason he was invited to give his perspective is not just to focus on CARICOM and the internal process, but to use and see that as a way of thinking about Caribbean positioning within a wider landscape of international relations. So just as I think uh, Prudence gave the view of the AFCFTA, the internal dimensions, I think Junior will use that CARICOM in the CARICOM analog, but also see how these regional sort of integration settings, how effective they are in positioning us to be more competitive internationally. And he and his background, obviously, in the EU negotiations, would be able to give us really a great perspective on that. So without further ado, let me pass uh, the floor um, or the virtual space to Mr. Lodge to provide his contemplations on CARICOM and CARICOM in the wider international economic space. Over to you, Junior. All right, thank you very much, um, Genevieve, and um, uh, kudos to you and your team and your um, colleagues um, for uh, organizing this webinar um, as my former boss. I should recognize that Ambassador Bernal uh, registered. This is um, very much a timely uh, event and hopefully we can meet the challenge um, also meted out by um, Juan Kelly, our former um, colleague uh, from Geneva days. Um, what I wanted to do was to, uh, is to sketch uh, the contours of uh, Caribbean uh, regional integration uh, process, uh, in particular CARICOM, but also to uh, posit uh, some ideas with respect to a shared agenda in terms of pursuing African Caribbean um, trade. Um, again, Geneva has done a very good job in terms of uh, summarizing the similarities uh, between Africa uh, and the Caribbean. Uh, in terms of the institutional processes, but also in terms of the, uh, the, the rather structural challenges um, that we face uh, as being uh, relatively um, small economies being uh, uh, exposed uh, to the vagaries of international trade where we are trade dependent. Uh, we have had a long history of being preference uh, dependent. And of course we have also a heavily concentrated number of both products and export destinations. Uh, in the case of the Caribbean, uh, for example, uh, our top three uh, uh, trading partners uh, universally tend to be uh, the United States, uh, the European Union, and China. 
uh, I think that on review of the data, trade, last trade data that I saw, uh, only in one instance was a federal carry come country a major trading partner of the other. And I think that was in the case of Trinidad and Tobago. So there are these uh, strong similarities. In terms of Caribbean regional um, integration, uh, we have had this rather classic arc of moving from a free trade area agreement, CARIFTA, uh, to a customs union called the Caribbean Community, and now to something called the CSME, which is a single economy or a single market and economy. Um, they are, the, 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 the CSME uh, provides for uh, the harmonization of a host of, uh, of policies, economic policies, investment policies, fiscal policies, and monetary uh, policies. Uh, but it is fair to say that that endeavor of establishing a single uh, economy uh, remains an aspiration uh, because a number of uh, 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 of the measures um, that were uh, announced uh, when the Treaty of Chagaramas was revised in 1992 um, are yet uh, to be uh, implemented. Uh, but in terms of the trade dimension um, of the uh, CSME, here again, we have the classic uh, uh, construct of a common external tariff uh, uh, harmonized rules of origin with uh, customs uh, procedures. Uh, we have the right of establishment. We have uh, trade and defense, uh, trade defense measures. We have uh, SBS and TBT um, uh, provisions, uh, but there's also a very strong built-in agenda, um, which refers to uh, public procurement, uh, e-commerce, uh, co uh, competition policy, uh, um, uh, and the treatment um, of uh, trade uh, facilitation. So there's still a considerable uh, implementation um, deficit uh, to, be, uh, uh, to be addressed. And I will try to posit uh, some reasons why that is, uh, that is the case in the, uh, in the Caribbean. We are, compared to Africa, uh, the Caribbean has a very modest uh, GDP uh, of 90 uh, billion um, US dollars in 1990, sorry, in 2019. Uh, I can imagine, I've not seen the latest uh, figures, but everything uh, anecdotally suggests that um, uh, that figure uh, would have uh, been reduced as a result of the, uh, of the pandemic. Um, but we are also highly indebted uh, economies, and this in fact uh, impacts heavily on uh, the implementation of the uh, uh, of the CSME with respect to um, its uh, trade um, uh, trade regime. Um, the implementation of the Caribbean trade uh, uh, regime is impaired by a number of uh, factors. One is just the mere fact that we are not a uh, physically contiguous uh, region and therefore the limits of regional integration are heavily exposed. Um, second, we are um, visited unfortunately um, uh, on a regular basis uh, by natural disasters. Uh, I saw a figure on the uh, published by ECLAC uh, that suggested that uh, since 2000, uh, the year 2000, we in the Caribbean have had uh, close to 350 uh, uh, instances of national disasters. The impact is not only in terms of uh, um, the destruction of economic infrastructure and therefore the blighting of, um, of GDP, um, but also in terms of fueling um, high debt. Uh, and again, this is uh, a rather unfortunate reality of Caribbean, um, of Caribbean uh, economic uh, reality that we are highly indebted uh, um, countries. Um, but I'd also want to suggest that one of, the, uh, uh, one of the factors that we are facing, and I think Geneve briefly alluded to this, is the fact that the CARICOM is 
a community of sovereign states. All, four, all 15 countries bar one, Monstrat, are independent sovereign states. And these are sovereign states that uh, revere their sovereignty and therefore are heavily reluctant to cede any modicum of, uh, of state power. And therefore, uh, this is reflected in, 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 in terms of this very, very strong implementation deficit uh, that, we have, um, that we have experienced. But I'd also want to suggest that, in a sense, part of the challenges that we face in the Caribbean uh, is also because of the weight of the state, the weight of the state as the preeminent development actor. Um, and uh, this is something that, in my view, we need to address in terms of recognizing that there are also other uh, development um, actors, uh, whether it is in terms of representatives of youth um, and women, whether it is economic operators, um, uh, non-state actors, um, um, academics uh, and thinkers, um, that we need to find space in order to establish a, 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 a collective platform in terms of how we move the regional integration uh, process forward. It is in recognition of this uh, implementation deficit and longstanding implementation um, deficit. While uh, recently a, uh, a report was published, it is uh, I think called the CARICOM report on the, on the economy and one of the uh, it, one of the recommendations wa was actually, it was titled uh, Caribbean 9.58, uh, Speeding Up the Caribbean. Uh, and uh, one of the first recommendations it uh, mentioned uh, chimes fully with what Juan Kelly had mentioned, which is in terms of this, the time is now. Um, and in fact, that is exactly what the Persaud uh, report, which I'd like to call it after its chairman, um, said that uh, in positing a series of uh, actions that needed to be implemented, it says the time is now. Uh, uh, I read that also as a play on a 1992 report of the West Indian Commission, uh, uh, which uh, whose publication on furthering Caribbean uh, economic integration was also called time for action. So this has been a long-standing uh, problem that we uh, have faced. Um, but that Persaud report, uh, one of the interesting elements uh, was establishing that precisely because Caribbean economies are highly indebted, it basically wanted to focus on low-hanging fruits. And some of these are in terms of uh, moving um, towards variable geometry, uh, recognizing that uh, uh, we might need to uh, move at different speeds in terms of the regional integration process um, and uh, facilitating uh, such uh, an endeavor, um, but also um, uh, looking at specific uh, um, issues. So for example, facilitating freer movement of uh, people uh, by having uh, a fast uh, uh, ferry network uh, looking at uh, skills training um, in order to uh, develop not only a greater capacity uh, for Caribbean uh, professionals, but also their mobility within uh, the Caribbean. Um, and also uh, trying to leverage uh, private sector investment um, to uh, support uh, economic um, uh, uh, resistance. Um, it is interesting, the Persaud report as a platform to try to reignite Caribbean uh, integration and CARICOM integration in particular. Um, and I think it is in that context why uh, the African continental free trade area is very interesting uh, because we see uh, an approach uh, which mirrors basically that of the Caribbean, uh, a rather ambitious, um, but top heavy institutional approach towards um, regional integration. Uh, 
we have long had an interest in looking at what is happening elsewhere in terms of regional integration uh, processes, uh, in particular, uh, uh, the Pacific Alliance, which is uh, a group of countries um, that mirror, uh, mirrors that of the Caribbean insofar as that they are also not uh, physically contiguous. Um, but at the same time, trying to promote regional integration. And at the same time, these are countries with a rather wide disparity in levels of per capita um, GDP. But in my view, that is a rather a hands-on, um, private sector driven uh, process. And I think it is worth uh, reviewing for the sake uh, of looking at how we can reunite uh, Caribbean um, uh, integration. Let me look, uh, turn briefly to uh, uh, Africa and the Caribbean in terms of trade uh, prospects. And I think that perhaps the most important dimension that I took from Juan Kaley's presentation uh, is this figure of 3.4 million uh, US dollars in terms of the continental GDP, the current levels of current uh, continental GDP. That would make uh, Africa, if it were one single country, a G5 country, okay? So it is rather significant. Uh, and I think that it is worth uh, exploring what are the concrete opportunities that we in the Caribbean can undertake uh, collectively with uh, friends in Africa uh, to exploit what is obviously a huge market and one that is uh, destined uh, to grow significantly and quickly. It, uh, in saying that, however, we, we instantly need to recognize that uh, the big challenge that we face in terms of exploiting such opportunities uh, is the fact of the absence of uh, uh, transportation links, whether it is air uh, or maritime. And the sad reality is that that constraint will remain for some time uh, to come. Interestingly enough, the figure, uh, the data that Janib uh, showed um, uh, with respect to current Af Africa Caribbean trade, uh, it is dominated by Gabon. And the interesting thing uh, is that that is oil. That is Trinidad and Tobago importing oil, refining it and exporting it further uh, to, other, uh, to other markets. So in a sense, there is a, 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 a shipping component that already exists, but as we know, that is very specific uh, to uh, to oil. So that's the reality. Um, in a sense, um, of course, uh, the pandemic is not uh, a great uh, event, either in human or economic um, terms. But what we're seeing, however, is that, uh, as is so often the case, that out of a challenge, uh, opportunities might emerge. And one of the uh, key areas that has emerged uh, uh, from this is in terms of a recognition um, that pursuit of resilience in economic, in social, in public health, in environmental, in technological dimensions is key. And this is something that we have had to face in the Caribbean precisely because of our exposure um, to both um, economic and environmental um, um, challenges. And therefore, uh, the, 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 the never before has the age of uh, digital trade and digital and, and opportunities in digital trade been stronger than before. So while we might not necessarily have physical um, uh, transportation links that can catapult uh, traditional merchandise um, trade, there are other opportunities in particular uh, in services uh, that we could um, capture. And I will suggest that we develop some kind of uh, agenda uh, that we can pursue um, uh, uh, such um, opportunities in particular in terms of creative um, um, goods and services because both uh, regions are very, very strong um, in this um, area and uh, we need to uh, see what are the opportunities that we can, that we can do uh, to exploit uh, such opportunities. Let me end by suggesting what are these concrete elements that we can uh, pursue. One is in terms of um, harnessing economic prospects in the blue economy. 
Again, uh, both regions are very, very strong in terms of this um, area. I'm particularly interested in bioprospecting. Uh, uh, this is a, an opportunity which is presented by uh, UNCLOS, uh, and we should be able to develop both a research agenda uh, that can uh, allow us to exploit this heritage uh, that we um, have, uh, but also in terms of the regulatory framework. Uh, and in fact, uh, the number, a number of uh, recommendations or suggestions uh, that I have are precisely in this area of regulatory framework, because I think that, that uh, therein lies the major challenge that both uh, of our regions um, face. So first is in terms of uh, the blue economy, um, where we have uh, shared um, uh, interest. Um, the second is in terms of uh, industrial standards. And uh, uh, I want to recognize uh, the work of uh, two bodies um, that are collaborating and albeit uh, outside of the gaze of our policymakers. And these are ARSU, the African Standards Organization, and CrossQ, uh, its Caribbean equivalent. And I want to, again, uh, recognize the, 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 the work that uh, the respective secretary generals uh, of these organizations are doing because they have an MOU and, and it is not just a document. I gather that, for example, in the last week, uh, CrossQ participated in the 20, 26th General Assembly of ARSO. Uh, they have done work in terms of supporting the Pacific uh, to develop their regional standards um, uh, uh, infrastructure. They have also, um, uh, ARSO has kindly uh, granted uh, at zero cost um, its standards on cassava uh, to CrossQ, uh, for CrossQ to consider and develop a Caribbean equivalent. Um, and I also uh, gather that uh, there's some other work that is being done with respect to um, looking at uh, uh, um, novel areas of economic activity. Um, and on that score, I would recommend tasking both entities to look at industrial standards precisely in those areas of innovation uh, or, or, or promising economic activities. So for example, renewable, um, uh, both renewable energies and sustainable products. So only recently, UNCTAD published a report on a Jamaican firm that uh, has produced uh, renewable bamboo straws um, that would remove the equivalent, if I have the data uh, correctly, of 15 million straws that would otherwise either litter uh, the uh, Jamaican cities or beaches. So it is about looking at those kind of uh, trade regulatory um, provisions where we can really push the agenda in terms of sustainable development. Um, so that's the second. Um, the third is in terms of uh, looking at digital trade of creative uh, products, because as I mentioned before, this is an area where we have uh, uh, a very strong um, interest um, and can uh, uh, overcome the, the lack of, uh, the lack of uh, trade infrastructure and in particular uh, maritime or sea um, uh, uh, transportation links. Um, just, of it, just two other areas. One is in terms of developing a trade and uh, development agenda for engagement in the multilateral forum. And here I have in, part, in mind, in particular, uh, trying to replicate uh, the trade facilitation agreement architecture on special and differential treatment to new products um, and new disciplines. Um, and of course, also in that regard, uh, looking at tax, um, at tax uh, governance. Um, and here, I'm particularly interested not simply in trying to overcome uh, what is happening in the OECD um, and in particular by the EU, but also in terms of creating financing for uh, uh, sustainable development, which is a key area uh, emerging after the pandemic uh, in terms of how our countries can recover. And the final um, area, is in terms of facilitating uh, business development by uh, mandating our respective business support organizations to A, talk to each other and bring 
business people on board uh, because uh, as a former policymaker uh, uh, um, or as university uh, activists and, think and thinkers, um, the, 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 we can recommend uh, areas for uh, trade and investment cooperation, but of course, it is the preserve of real economic operators to engage. So I think that there is a kind of uh, agenda that we can map, um, but also concrete uh, interventions that we can pursue in order to drive greater uh, African Caribbean trade and economic engagement. Thank you. Thank you so much, Junior Lodge. Uh, these were some excellent and concrete ideas for moving uh, the discussion forward. And I'll just say that, you know, many people wrote me and said, you know, we, we, we don't want any more discussion of the rules. We want something that is private sector oriented that's going to move the needle. Um, and, and my response was, well, we need to understand each other first. We need to understand what the respective integration processes are. But I think, Julia, you managed to sort of, in your presentation, not just give a little bit about the rules, but also come forward with five or six concrete uh, sets of proposals, which may be, you know, the subject of a second webinar series once we're done with this. Um, I'd invite Prudence um, to also turn on his camera. We have a couple of questions and we have 10 minutes to get through them. So with Colo, we'll, we'll sort of co-moderate this session. And Colo, I want to pick up on some of the questions and comments. We've got some great kudos for putting this together. Um, and I'm going to, as a fellow St. Lucian, I'm going to read out Dr. Russell Thomas's <laughs> comments. Um, he's residing in Uganda, a senior lecturer in international relations with Cavendish University. Welcome. Um, he wanted to know what measures will be or have been put in place to ensure mitigation of adverse effects on supply chains which we witnessed uh, sort of be decimated as a result of the challenges uh, for the global pandemic that we are witnessing. Um, I also wanted to ask the panelists if they're comfortable to share their email addresses because somebody anonymously would like to follow up with you. <laughs> Another question that I will pull from the list and then I'll, I'll let Kolo pill whichever one she wants. Um, I think Gabrielle Jelino, um, who I know, uh, was very also complimentary of this initiative. Um, and she's happy with this not notion of Pan-Africanism, um, which I think is an excellent term as well and wonderful to promote that here. And her uh, in sort of contribution is there is definitely a demand for African goods in the Caribbean in the areas of clothing, woodworking, and in services, uh, oil and health, sort of, you know, oil services, especially with the discoveries in Guyana um, and Trinidad having, and Suriname as well, having pre existing oil industries, maybe the services provided. Uh, from more well-developed um, African oil industrial development could perhaps be put to some use in the Caribbean. So these were two sort of sets of specific questions posed. Uh, and I'll let the speakers sort of chew on these a little bit more and then turn over to Kolo if she wanted to grab any of the other questions. Okay, so uh, while our speakers are thinking about uh, the few questions that have been posed, there's one practical question from David Salmon, who is a university, uh, who's a university student at the University of West Indies, and he wants to know if there are any internship opportunities or fellowship programs for students who may be interested in studying or working at the Secretariat of the AFCFTA. So I think uh, Mr. Sebahiza will be able to to deal with that. And secondly, also related to the AFCFTA, um, His Excellency, this is Anwadike Bakas, who says the Excellency, Mr. Mkele, mainly mentioned the AFCFTA pulled from various um, FTAs, including the WTO. And specifically, what is the comparison? How is it different? How is the disbetterment system of the AFCFTA compared to the other bodies? And um, let me see. 
I think I'll also then follow up on what DK Wax's question, and this is the last one I think then maybe we can have the opportunity to answer is, uh, with the Caribbean being part of the African diaspora, and with the newly established African Caribbean Chamber of Trade Commerce, are the existing components within the AFCFTA for more active diaspora involvement? So it seems like those last three questions were specifically directed to Mr. Savahizi, but of course, Mr. Junior Lodge can also contribute uh, as he wishes. So but maybe we have- Hold on, let me just help the panelists with that question on dispute settlement and in the process, put a plug for our webinar, webinar five on the 22nd of July. Shameless. <laughs> Us. But we will be talking about dispute settlement then. So if any of the speakers wanted to mention anything, they are fine. But if they felt that they wanted to leave that alone, uh, we'll be taking it up in a later webinar. Over to you, gentlemen. Uh, who goes first? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, let me let me um, uh, let, let me try to. Uh, to go first since um, uh, Junior has been speaking uh, so that you can drink water. Um, I will start with, uh, with a question on the, on the mitigation measures, uh, which I think was asked by uh, uh, Dr. Russell. Um, the experience that we have had with the COVID-19 pandemic was that um, there is, of course, um, global uh, disruption of, um, of of supply chains, and this has had effect, especially um, on landlocked countries, but also on countries that have been depending a lot um, on global trade. Um, in my presentation, I have mentioned that Africa uh, has been uh, trading at about 82 percent with the rest of of the world, in only. 18% within Africa. So this is uh, something that has to be addressed um, uh, structurally. Uh, why? Because um, even if there are measures to improve the supply chains in the global supply chains, this over-reliance on the global market, in the case of pandemic where each country is concerned by its own um, uh, borders uh, protection, then our economies are not sustainable. So uh, they have been put in place some measures to facilitate the flow of essential goods across the continent, um, especially um, at regional level where uh, countries had uh, trade agreements or trade facilitation agreements. Um, but it becomes difficult to facilitate trade um, between countries that do not have a common legal framework, which do not have any legal instrument that govern their trade. So the FCFTA has come in as a response if we have to facilitate uh, supply chains on the continent, at least we have a common uh, legal framework for 55 countries, which can be used uh, in future to mitigate um, uh, some of the effects of pandemics. But when it comes to global supply chains, trade between Africa and the rest of the world, then we have to rely on other uh, type of instruments such as uh, WTO. Um, and not all African countries are members of the WTO. And not all um, uh, world countries are uh, members of WTO. So uh, the pandemic has taught Africa that we have to start looking inward and see what are we able to produce for our consumers. That's very important. Can't we not be able at least to produce the minimum of our needs and then rely on the rest of the world on the rest? Because if there is a case of closing borders abruptly, then the people who are relying on importation are going to suffer a lot. And this has been the experience of most African countries. Um, the second uh, specific question on internship opportunities, which was asked by, um, uh, I think, David uh, Salmon. Uh, yes, uh, there are opportunities for young people, um, not only within FCFTA Secretariat, but also at African Union um, level in general. Uh, there is a program 
of Young Professionals, which is uh, a program for African Union. Um, African Union uh, receives young professionals um, every six months. So the platform for applying is open to everyone. Uh, if you go to au.int, uh, which is the website of African Union, under career, you will be able to see um, where to apply for those kind of opportunities, internship, uh, youth volunteers, and young professionals. And the FCFTS Secretariat in particular is looking forward to, um, to receive a number of young professionals who will be um, uh, developing their talents um, in-house, but also uh, looking for uh, establishing uh, FCFT Academy uh, that will be creating awareness around FCFTA to everyone who is, uh, who is interested. Um, the question to, related to this resettlement, which um, of course I'm not uh, uh, competent enough to answer, I would like to uh, just mention that the FCFTA uh, legal framework uh, provides for a protocol on rules and procedures for the settlement of disputes. And that protocol establishes um, a district settlement body um, of the AFCFTA, uh, which has um, uh, two levels, the panel of experts and, uh, and the appellate body. And all those um, bodies are going to be uh, dealing with disputes that will arise uh, from interpretation of the AFCFTA agreement or from implementation of the agreement. Um, the, the thing that I have to uh, emphasize is that um, the FCFTA dispute settlement mechanism will look at state-to-state uh, uh, -state disputes. So it has not provided for um, investor state disputes. It is only state-to-state -state, um, dispute settlement mechanism. So I think those are the three questions that I want to speak about, unless I have omitted any. Uh, but in the meantime, as a junior come in, maybe I will be able to go through um, other questions that have been put in the chat box. Thank you. Junior, I, as you I contemplate the previous questions, can I just take uh, two more as you think? Um, and you're free to answer those um, that you, you feel comfortable. One is this idea of these transportation gaps between Africa and the Caribbean, um, which a trade agenda should perhaps envelope. Uh, you know, as a means to facilitate movement of persons and goods, how are we bridging that transportation gap? And then one of our colleagues over at Trafka, uh, who will be speaking in a subsequent webinar, Makong, affectionately called, um, African and Caribbean markets are mostly made up of SMEs and MSMEs, in some cases to a tune of a 97 to three ratio relative to the bigger multinationals. Uh, is this a compelling case to rethink the structure of our agreements and how can effective measures be weaved into trade agreements to harness the immense potential in trade and development? That's a big question, but uh, leaving, leaving you and uh, Prudence with that, and then I think we will wrap up. All right, thanks. Uh, let me just... Um... Uh, try and deal with this in like uh, 60 seconds because I'm afraid I have to go myself. Um, recently, CARICOM uh, uh, promulgated a multilateral air services agreement. And this is important, uh, again, in, in, in addressing this uh, problem that we have in the Caribbean, which is, of, of course, our physical uh, uh, nature makes uh, air transportation that much uh, challenging. Um, and of course, this is something that perhaps we can explore uh, with uh, Africa. I think that perhaps I would go a different route, which is to try to start modestly, uh, even though of course there is uh, uh, considerable untapped opportunities uh, for African um, trade, but to try and explore uh, either digital trade and particular focusing on a select um, uh, body uh, of, uh, of uh, products um, so that we can jumpstart that process uh, as opposed to trying to be overly ambitious and failing and therefore draining all possible confidence. So that's the first point. 
being a little bit more modest and targeted. Um, that's the first. The second is that uh, we have uh, a number of bilateral investment um, uh, treaties. They're not that many, there are only three. Uh, Barbados has two with Mauritius and Ghana. Jamaica has one with, uh, with Egypt. Um, there is a promise, as you know, Geneve, of, the, of a WTO investment uh, facilitation uh, agreement, um, but that is only a promise. So again, perhaps this is something that we need to explore again with our business support organizations because they are on the ground and they can say what is realistically um, uh, um, what can be realistically pursued. But I would prefer to be targeted and focused so that we can deliver and thereby engender confidence that we can indeed uh, harness the immense uh, potential that Africa uh, provides. I'm afraid with that, I have to go. Yes, I think we're really pushing up against, uh, well, we've passed our deadline by five minutes, but um, I'll let Polo close, but I wanted to give uh, prudence and opportunity to make any final remarks. And thank uh, you. Yes, let me, let me, let me just, let, let me just. Sorry, Prudence, I think Junior really literally had to run. So thank you so much. And I will follow up with him to thank you. Go ahead, Prudence, apologies. Yeah, thank you, thank you. I think uh, Junior uh, has made a very good point. And I want to uh, to conclude by, by responding to uh, Macomb. Um, his question is very pertinent, whether we need to, uh, to rethink uh, the structure of African trade agreements, um, given the fact that African economies, Caribbean markets are mostly made up of small and medium enterprises uh, to the ratio of uh, seven uh, to three uh, compared to multinational companies. Uh, what, what I think is that uh, the problem should not be uh, in the design of the legal instrument. I think the problem should be in the implementation of those agreements. Um, if you put in place um, uh, appropriate measures, if you put in place appropriate strategies for implementing those agreements, I'm quite sure uh, that we'll be able to, um, to promote uh, those small and medium enterprises. And that's what Africa, African continental free trade area is aiming at. The legal instrument itself is not discriminating them, but implementation, we have to make sure that it put an emphasis on the, on the SMEs. We put at the forefront the SMEs, we put at the forefront um, youth in, in, in trade, we put at the forefront um, women in trade, because we know uh, they are important stakeholders for Africa's economic development. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Prudence. And I think this uh, it's about time for us also to wrap up. We would like to really thank all of our speakers today, uh, His Excellencies, uh, Mr. Banal, and of course, Mr. Mene, and also, of course, our experts, uh, Mr. Prince Sibahazi, Sibahazi and Mr. Junior Lodge, for really sharing a wealth of knowledge and experience from both regions. We hope that this sets, uh, you know, the tone for the rest of the webinar series because, uh, you know, the bar has been set really, really high, and we really encourage you to to um, register, of course, and to attend the rest of the sessions, which I will quickly share with you on our screen today, right now, before we. Um, Conclude. Do I have it? Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Geneva. I was busy trying to find it. So uh, as you can see there, the next of our series will be on the newer age issues. So e-commerce, gender and MSMEs. And this will happen next week on the 30th of June and would be followed by uh, the trade regimes, uh, good services and intellectual property on the 9th of July. Thereafter, investment regimes on the 13th of July. And last but not least, a webinar that has been punted before that um, my colleague Jenny Vramier and I will be uh, speaking about this assessment on both and both regions. And thank you again for your attendance. Thank you again for your support. We really hope that this is just the beginning and of course a continuation of a friendship that has started a long time ago, but this time really hope to push the boundaries of you know the talking shop and just talking and really creating links that are long lasting and sustainable. So we hope to see you next time. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Paulo, and to all of our co-collaborators, Trala Trabka, Afro, Afronomics Law, Jay Patterson. I think I'm missing one. Uh, Trabka, Afronomics, Afronomics Law. Afronomics Law. <laughs> Afronomics law. Um, yes, uh, and, and all of the contributing uh, entities like the AFCFTA Secretariat, the CARICOM Secretariat, ITC, all will be featured soon in the upcoming webinars. Your registration to today's session will entitle you to all of the other webinars, but we encourage you strongly to share this uh, wonderful series, please, in your network. We have wonderful speakers, and a recording of this uh, webinar will be made available on our social platforms. Thank you so much, co-host Colo. Thank you, Prudence. Thank you. Thank you. The wonderful audience for gracing us with their presence and Ambassador Bernal for his introductory remarks and our keynote speaker, His Excellency Mene, for his wonderful tone in setting this to the right start. So thank you all and we'll see you next week. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Bye, Colo. This is who we are. Yeah.